deep scholar sky observer, and his project is a new generation of Dobsonians. Zane, you got the you got some stage. Hi, uh, okay, this is loud. Um, right at the moment, I think. Um, yes, okay. uh, yeah, so my presentation is on a variety of different things. Obviously, um, I'm not going to be able to cover anything super in depth. Like, one, one thing I would love to do in whole set of talk about would be meniscus mirrors. Mike would probably, Mike would probably slide me to that, but I don't know, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but uh, this is, uh, these are some photos of scopes. Bill Long and Friends, and it's trying to get them anyway. So, uh, yeah, a bit about me. Um, this is my little resume. Um, yeah, I actually have a degree in communications, which is pretty useless for making telescopes. Uh, I've been working on scopes for uh, five, six years. Uh, I've had, oh, that's where I'm uh, I've actually had a 351 telescopes. Now I just bought my 351st here the, the other day. It was a 5 SC, which this thing made a beat the pants off. Um, and I moved to Arizona at the end of 2021 for an internship, that's actually a lie. I moved there for uh, astronomy, but uh, I had to justify it somehow. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I do PR writing and any stuff, looking for something more to do with that. Anyway, um, so why why do we do observing in the first place? Well, there's a lot of reasons. And I just threw this slide together. You know, a lot of people really like this new EAA stuff, which I like to slam because I feel like it kind of goes against observing. You're looking at a picture on the screen. I process that picture and make it look good. Or maybe just stick to a TV and uh, some Hubble photos. Yeah, uh, and it's fun. All that, that, that. Anyway, it's, um, so the Dobsonian telescopes, many people know, is kind of a huge deal because before the Dobsonians, it's something like a four and a half inch year, which is all you would really aspire to because a big machine equatorial mount is either, is either expensive or not very good or not very portable or all of the above. If you've ever seen an old 10 inch or 12 inch cave reflector, for instance, uh, you might know that those are, well, they were brand new transportable. They're not exactly the most movable things. They were, of course, way too expensive for the average person. And, uh, of course, it's just sort of unbuilt. So Dobsonians, of course, kind of eliminate all that because, you know, you can just build one out of some cheap plywood and throw together an amount in a day. And, um, or you can just buy one. Uh, and, of course, you know, you can get up to about a 16 to 20 inch scope before you start to run into problems uh, transporting a typical truck tube Dobsonian and setting one up yourself. Uh, of course, you know, there is the Aug 25, but having worked with a lot of 22 to 25 inch scopes, I would say I would, a conventional one, I wouldn't really recommend trying to set up all by yourself unless you have a trailer and it's relatively short and so forth. Um, uh, but um, of course, these days, Dobsonians aren't really uh, inexpensive anymore. They're only inexpensive when compared to everything else. Um, to buy an 8 inch Dob and a couple of eyepieces, and the somewhat mandatory nebula filter, I would argue, and share, um, you're basically looking at $1,000 to set that up. Because the scope itself is about $700. Um, if you want a 10, you're looking at 1500 If you want a 12 inch all in, which is going to be a solid tube, which will kill you to move, but anyway, then you're looking at about $2,000. And of course, um, when inflation is a near 10% and people, and people are more interested in paying for their gas money, telling someone they need about $1,000 to get what is widely considered the bare minimum in a beginner telescope is kind of a hard sell. I would go so far as to say it's almost an insult. Um, and of course, if you go over 12 inches now, um, with Orion's uh, lawsuits limit and uh, supply chain issues uh, limiting the uh, market uh, further, um, there really aren't a lot of consistent options for anything over about 12 inches, unless you either go on the used market or um, you get one of the scopes from Orion or Skywatcher, which aren't really portable, or you get a premium scope, which at that point, you suddenly are looking at, you know, you're, you know, you go from a 12 inch at about 2K to maybe a trust tube 12, maybe three or four times that. Uh, when, and then, you know, 20 inch, 20 inches, forget it, you're looking at the price of a car. Uh, again, uh, not really an easy sell for anybody, even if they're quite into this. Um, and that's kind of dumb because the whole point about Sony is to be cheap, and the reality is that you can still make one if you make the mirror for a well, small chunk of that, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, and if you go online and you say, oh, I want to make my own telescope to save money, you get these outdated responses from people who live in fantasy land where an eight inch job is still $400 because they didn't bother to check. Um, and of course, you'll be told to make like a six inch F8 mirror and scope, which is sort of a waste of time. And uh, that, you know, anything over like 12 inches is insanity. And that you need a full thickness Pyrex plate because don't, don't even think about plate guns because there's just like wall with it, you know? Um, also, um, I would say as getting into astronomy, um, 
I really wish I had run into someone who was doing set a setup just now on the sidewalk or something, because it probably would have gotten me to get a good scope and do more observing a lot sooner. Instead, I was subjected to the public observatory scene in Connecticut, where the local observatory was run by a guy who didn't even want to be there, um, and was about as nice as, uh, well, I would say it was, it, was a, it, was, it was marginally more welcoming than a typical uh, high school class that I went to, which I wouldn't call welcoming either. Um, a guy would scream at kids for having lights on their sneakers. He was obsessed with dark adaptation when you're looking at Jupiter in the mortal cities. Uh, yeah, uh, not the, not the friendly sort. But um, of course, yeah, I'm going to get to that again. Um, there's, there's more to touch on that. But anyway, um, yeah, th this is sort of the situation if you want a good scope now. Uh, I actually just found out Aperture is discontinuing their lower cost DT DOBs, which is great, of course. Uh, you know, if you want a 24 inch, you're looking at $20,000. Bigger. I mean, that's not including. New Moon is great. Higher than money. If you have money, but uh, $20,500 $20, is the base price, not including fees, shipping, taxes, and accessories, um, any changes to the optical design, or I even think the shroud. So, yeah. Um, and if you go online again, if you post about wanting to make your own telescope on typical message boards, you get responses like this, um, which is, again, really, really encouraging. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of doom posting about you know, how light pollution is so bad that visual observing is essentially a waste of time. And that we should all instead live stream the moon or deep sky objects on television screens or with the beloved unistellar EV scope, which takes this and manages to inflate the cost of, of it to about uh, five thousand dollars by sticking a one hundred dollar camera sensor and crappy go-to in the equation. And that thing sells like crazy, and then you see all of them on aftermarket cloudy nights and eBay and two weeks later for half the new price because as it turns out they suck and are very boring. Um, and of course. <laughs> A lot of big Johnsonians are kind of the antithesis of, of course, uh, well, inexpensive, of course, but also convenient and portable. Um, you look at something like this 32-inch Tektron, which is the vast majority of scopes in the above 20-inch range are something like this, where the truss poles, you can assemble them yourself, but wiggling the upper cage on top is kind of crazy. Uh, you know, the ladder is required, and you need a big ladder, and you're kind of at the point where falling off that ladder is going to mean a trip to the hospital. Uh, and uh, of course, there's liability too. If you do that, you know, you don't want to set this up for other people because they can sue you. Uh, especially not like playing on a public night at school or anything. You need a trailer to move it, which is again a massive commitment, both in cost and complexity. You know, then if you, if you want to use this scope, every time you use it, if you don't have a good site at home, you got to hitch the trailer, you got to go drive the trailer. You might have to take it in the route because of, I'm from the Northeast. There are a lot of roads you can't put a trailer on. Um, and then, you know, you probably get stuck in traffic from taking it to the you have to drive slower, uh, and all that. Uh, your trailer could get a flat if you drive over a pothole. Uh, um, and of course, and there's of course the cost. So, you know, something like a 32 inch job, best case, something like this Tektron here, that I had a friend of mine owns, this thing's set up in a permanent observatory at a Oral 2 3 site, and I am one of the only five, three people to have looked through it in the past 15 years. I'm very lucky to. But I also completely see why. Um, like, uh, this is a friend here. She never used this scope again. I'm taking this photo. She was terrified of the ladder. Uh, she would not go back to me to look through it because she was like, I cannot enjoy looking through it because I am terrified of falling off the whole time, which is understandable. I feel the same way. I just kind of signed up. Um, so, this is actually my friend Matt here, who's currently holding the phone uh, with his 12 before it turned purple. Um, but it's sort of a great example of uh, the scopes that are sort of um, <coughs> leading the way and making Dobsonians faster, better, cheaper, um, which literally faster focal reaches. There's spray silver. There's um, composite materials to reduce mass and, of course, the cost of plywood because that's pretty good. Mirror gun machines and sort of rethinking how we do trust tubes, uh, both assembling them, what the function is, and just the general execution of them. Because at the end of the day, the best part of uh, is no part. If you don't have to make a piece of scope, you don't have to deal with it, you don't have to move it, you have to worry about the cost of it, etc. So the simpler and cheaper, the better. Um, so one of the big advances that is something that I actually really, it, this is what got me into all of the other stuff. I joined a community of folks up in Oregon uh, who uh, were doing this and uh, some of the other things. This got me into it. It was uh, spray silvering. Now we just had a talk on uh, photometry and of course the disadvantage of silvering is that it will tarnish. One of the great leaps forward in spray silvering is um, 
You can use stuff uh, to, um, that you put on sort of like an anti-tarnish lacquer, which, believe it or not, does not affect the figure. And that will extend the lifespan of the coating to even a couple of years. Um, it does not make the coating tougher, so bugs and pollution will still eat it. Um, but of course, there's also, and there's also other things like you can put anti-tarnish cloth on piece of silverware in your mirror box. But um, you spray it on, you clean the mirror really well, you just spray it on. It does a really cool uh, chemical reaction that deposits a molecule spin film on top of the glass. And uh, again, that'll usually last, you know, it could last up to a couple years. I would say a year is probably the realistic expectation when you consider mechanical and chemical corrosion to it. Um, but of course, we have to clean our mirrors every year anyway with these big scopes. This is just cleaning with extra steps. This is literally maybe a 30 minute to an hour process. It's just, you rinse, instead of rinsing it off first, you strip the coating, then rinse it, then you wipe it down with talc, and then you spray the coating on. I use garden weed killer sprayers for my 20 inch that I did. Um, it's uh, not expensive. Um, anything about over about 16 inches, 16 inches or bigger, it's worth spray silver instead of recoat. Because with a recoat, you have to consider the coater might screw it up. The shipper might do what they did to my 24 and take all the padding out of the box, bounce it around the grate, and then take a chunk out of the mirror and scratch it. Uh, they might lose it too. Um, there's, of course, the cost of the shipping, there's the cost of the coating, there's the time frame of it, and of course, um, Silvering is really cheap. Uh, you need enough chemicals that you can cover the entire floor of this room in silver for about $150. They will expire before you run out of them. And uh, the actual apparatus to spray and clean is extremely cheap. Again, I went to Home Depot, I got garden weed killer sprays. I think I spent about $200 to equip myself for silvering. Then, of course, my parents threw away the chemicals after I silvered my 20, which is why I don't live with them anymore. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and the chemicals expire. And, um, you keep them in the fridge, they last longer. It's, it's, some of the chemicals expire, some of them don't. Cleanup is, of course, a little bit of an issue. Some people will tell you silver nitrate is explosive. That is true if you leave it in a hot environment for a prolonged period. That will also make it expire faster. So just keep it in your fridge. Um, it's not particularly dangerous. Uh, I would say pitch, which we use for polishing, is probably a less safe substance, and nobody has any qualms about using that all the time. Um, also, if the silver is fresh, it will be above 90% reflectivity for quite some time, which means uh, it's going to be better than standard aluminum. And enhanced aluminum is where you tend to get those problems with recoding and whatnot, and of course the price goes crazy. Um, so there are a lot of reasons to do spray silver. In my case, when I did it for my 20 inch, it was because the guy I had doing my aluminizing that was local couldn't do a 20 inch, and shipping it was going to be more than I had uh, budgeted for the old scope and coating it, of course. Um, I, um, I'm going to be spray silver in the next few years, for sure. You know, I'm going to spray silver in any just because I have, I have to buy meat from it anyway. Of course, if you're just doing an eight one-off, it makes more sense to just go with the next, but with the bigger scopes, it pays. Um, so a lot of people ask, you know, with these fast reflectors, why would you go below F4? I mean, this is an F8, so I can't really, this, I can't really comment. But why would you do a fast scope? Well, of course, at the larger end, it's to avoid the ladders. And people will say, well, this is a compromise to avoid the ladders. But it's, it's not really a compromise. I mean. Um, 100 degree eyepiece is allow you to actually sort of cheat, and you can get, uh, you can squeeze the most field of view out possible out of given exit people, which that's a whole topic that I could also go into for an hour. But um, my 14.7 scope that I use gets about a 1.7 degree field. Uh, if you use a C14, you are limited to about a 1 degree field. Tops, typical 14 inch style, 1 and a quarter degrees is probably the norm. And of course, even with a smaller scope where you're maybe not avoiding the ladder, Faster F ratio means shorter truss poles, more compact form factor, and a wider field. And um, you um, also can get a better uh, view with night vision eyepieces because uh, with night vision photo intensifiers because <coughs> they like fast F ratios. You do plan on doing photography or uh, photography? Uh, sorry, um, draw popped out of place there. Um, photography if you're uh, the fast F ratio actually makes um, uh, some imaging when you don't have that all test now easier. And uh, um, of course, if you are doing EAA, which of course I hate, but if you want to do it, fast effort would feel better. And of course, it used to be that only the teleview eyepieces were really well corrected enough to do this sort of thing. But now, um, with the advent of Chinese clones like APM, or is the big one, APM 1, Astronomic Suds 2, 100 degree eyepieces, these are pretty cheap. Uh, Coma corrector knocked off, also exists. Needs a quarter. Um, so I've been doing fast scopes for a few years. My first one was a 10-inch F3.2. I had a friend of mine in Australia to make the mirror. 
friend of mine did a six and seven career around the, around the same time. And uh, um, I uh, did a, my 14.7, which I still have. That's a mirror from Nova. I did a 24 inch with the mirror also from, uh, from, from Nova. I got rid of that. It wasn't particularly fast or uh, portable. The mirror was too inches thick. Um, so my 14.7 inch is actually here at Okitex. If you want to come look through it tonight, feel free. Um, I created it because I couldn't afford 18 or 20, which is what I really wanted. Yeah, in retrospect, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. In retrospect, um, I, uh, I'm actually really happy I went with it instead of the bigger stove. I don't know what's happening. Uh, sorry, um, a bigger stove because <clears throat> a bigger stove uh, would have been a lot less convenient. Uh, for me, and when I was living in an apartment for a while, this was really great to have a 14 inch that you could easily carry downstairs or even pick up in one piece. It's actually overbuilt and it's still uh, about 55, 50, 55 pounds. Um, and I can get a 1.7 degree field, though if I was to use eyepieces that provided a slightly oversized exit pupil, which I can accommodate, uh, my eyes go like 9 millimeters in the so I'm stupid. But uh, that, the background, the back, the background gets bright. Um, uh, you can get about two degrees. My secondary is a little undersized for doing that. You probably have something in that you could, which is pretty cool. And uh, it's actually so short and needs legs to elevate it. I used to have an EQ platform. Um, I need to build another EQ platform when I move to Tucson. It will work in New York anymore. I actually sold it to Matt because um, it works in his lab. Um, and then there's, uh, of course, on top of the fast food, there's the other thing that makes these easier and arguably better to make is to this. Meniscus mirrors, where you get a thin piece of clay pass, usually three, three quarters of an inch, and you um, you slump it in a convex mold where you let it slowly melt over this mold to a the shape of a contact lens or a maxi dot corrector would be the more apt comparison, and it's got a convex back curve that's the same as the concave sphere, the front curve just in reverse. So it sort of acts stiffer. So if you take a three quarter inch piece of glass and you slump it to a three quarter inch sagita, in principle, that would mean you'd have a uh, one and a half inch thick active mirror, which would, depending on the size, may or may not be good. But because you don't have this extra mass hanging on the sides anymore, it actually acts a little thicker and stiffer. Um, I'm not gonna go into physics of that because I'm not qualified to do so, but you can make a 32 inch or with a three quarter inch thick piece of glass and it will still work. Uh, you're pushing some things, but it'll still work. And uh, of course, a conventional three quarter inch thick 30 inch, you would literally run out of glass in the middle if you went fast enough. Um, so this avoids that. Um, they also um, cool more evenly, which is really weird because, um, of course, glass has a thing, differential thermal extension. And um, never say your moderator is not on the phone. Thank you. Um, the thermal expansion of glass, of course, is uh, different at the center of a typical mirror because the center is thinner because of the curve. But with a meniscus, we have a constant curve, so the expansion and contraction right. are uniform. So you don't get um, a lot of the aberrations that you usually see with um, uh, thermal expansion of glass with, mirror, with meniscus mirrors. What's weird is the focal plane tends to move. Um, uh, instead of getting spherical aberration, the whole focal length of the system changes slightly. The correction can also change. It really depends on how you ventilate and cool your mirror, how thick it is, and a variety of different factors with that. But again, I have really very little understanding of. I just like making these things. Um, and of course, they're light, which is really nice. I'm doing a 20 inch right now, and I've got a grinding machine, mainly for larger mirrors, but I actually did the 20 inch up to the end of fine grinding entirely by hand. And I'm not in shape or particularly uh, enthused about grinding mirrors by hand, but I still did it. Um, the biggest problem with anything of over about 16 inches is the friction during polishing is really high, uh, and you can't really push it by hand anymore unless you like um, a 500 pounds work surface where your tool is anchored to that, not going to move. But you can do them by hand, which is nice. And of course, moving them around to test and so forth is really easy. My 32 inch that I'm doing is only 60 pounds. Typical 32 inch you can't make up. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the glass is really cheap because you can literally get a glass tabletop that's tempered actually. Slump into the kiln, you detemper it in the annual process, and boom, you have a less than $250 20 inch blank, um, typically. And uh, of course, kilns, um, that is one of the big things. Uh, for a while, there was a company called BBC Tech that I would recommend highly for getting a, a meniscus mirror slumped. Unfortunately, um, the guy running it has 
um, at least temporarily closed business. It might it probably is going to be permanent. There's another company in Texas called Dottie Defense Optical Technologies Inc. that will do slump blanks for you, and they're very good quality, but they are a little expensive. It's at the point where building your own kiln if you want to do a bigger mirror might actually be a better idea. Um, yeah, and the meniscus mirrors are just really great. Again, you get these at fast F ratios without hogging out a curve too, which is another benefit. You don't you don't do eight grit, you don't do sixty grit. You start at one twenty, and that's it. And that also is quieter. Cleaning is easier. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into a full tutorial on mirror making, but making a meniscus mirror sort of is like having some of the first few steps done for you. Uh, especially if the back is smooth enough, you don't have to smooth the back. Which I had a blank once that I had to grind the back of uh, convex, which was annoying. Uh, that sort of made up for any uh, save time on the other stuff. But it, usually it's, it's quite a bit more efficient. Uh, I'm doing a 20 inch F3 right now. Um, that'll be about $2,000 to a bill all in, which is pretty good. Uh, and I'm doing a 32 inch F2.6 where the majority of the cost is actually going to be the 7 inch secondary mirror, which is about $1,500. Uh, the primary mirror black is 1000 And then uh, the entire rest of the scope grinding materials on that will be about $1,500. Um, again, $4,000 buys you a Trust Tube 12 and some other stuff to go with it. Uh, it might get you a brand new 14 with nothing else uh, from Sky Watcher, and that also weigh like 200 pounds because it's got a, a one inch thick particle board pieces and all that. Um, so I wouldn't really recommend one of those. Uh, anyway, and uh, the living magnitude in these is also pretty crazy. Um, you can get up to about magnitude 19 with a silver 32 inch, which is pretty cool. Uh, under dark skies. Night vision pushes it further. I've been using night vision and actually didn't edit this presentation since I've actually used it more and I have some different feelings on that, but you do get a different magnitude. Um, and the 32 inch and 20 inch are going to be full go to, and I'd like to do some after application and maybe photometry. But, but I don't really care about advertising my own projects because they're not really relevant. Um, one of the things we can do to reduce weight, by the way, is uh, ditch plywood for this pink polystyrene foam, which you may have seen in the installation in your house. Um, on its own, of course, if you just like stab it with something, it's pretty soft and malleable. Uh, it's very easy to bend, but if you <coughs> add some kind of thin layer of stick material to it, be it aluminum composite, plastic, or uh, even plywood, uh, thin plywood or plywood veneer, um, you get this super strong stuff that's on par in every structural dimension, in every structural um, uh, strength as actual plywood, but it weighs nothing. Uh, the foam is actually waterproof to by default, um, and the glues you use, as you use glue with it, that's waterproof. This stuff, uh, it's actually almost less effort to seal and all that than plywood is, which is kind of funny. Um, and it costs very little. You can cut it with a box cutter on your floor. And um, you can make pretty much all of the dog mount parts of your scope out of this. Um, if you use aluminum composite sheet for some other stuff in place of plywood, you could build a scope with pretty much just a pair of scissors and a box cutter and a uh, screwdriver if you really want, um, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, this isn't a new idea, by the way. Um, this guy, Steve Overhole, um, had a book on it called Lightweight Giants in late 1980s where he basically talks all about this stuff and it's really great and you can probably find it online. Uh, and uh, there are some ideas in there that don't work, but the, the pink phone is awesome. Um, there's also uh, this other thing that I have this right here. This actually isn't mine. This is my friend Matt's. Uh, thanks, Matt. Yeah. This is a wire spider. Now, as you can see, there's no spider veins in this, uh, holding the secondary mirror as you might be used to. Instead, we have extremely thin stainless steel wire. Now, this has a few advantages. For one thing, it's actually stronger than a um, conventional spider. Um, with big scopes, especially with large secondary mirrors, a spider with thin veins will have some sag and deflection from the weight of the secondary mirror pulling on it, as well as the sheer size. With this, you just tighten the wires more, and they don't flex. Um, there's no spikes from stars, uh, except on very, very, very bright things. There, but at the same time, if you have a curved main spider, that'll add a halo around white targets, like my scopes do. Um, and this doesn't have that problem. Uh, it holds collimation quite well. Um, you can, and all you have to do essentially is have a hub and then these eye bolts, and then either more eye bolts or guitar tuners for tensioning. And building this is actually easier than if you were to try to make your own spider. It also costs nothing. It's also extremely easy to repair, and it looks really cool because if you take a photo of it or you look at it at night, it looks like the secondary is floating. Now, I'm not going to do this. I don't have a full scope to pull up, but you can actually grab your scope by the secondary hub and move it around the sky with one of these, and it'll work fine. Um, when you won't adjust the collimation with it whatsoever. It also reduces the weight and the uh, physical size and footprint of stuff on your upper cage, which is really important with uh, minimizing the size of the rest of the scope because 
the wider the upper end is, the wider um, your bottom end can be the compensated. Um, to sort of go with that philosophy on uh, primary mirrors, there's, um, I don't have one to show you because uh, I've not done it yet. I should have put Sasha's ball scope in here already. No. Have a photo of that. Uh, but um, if you ever heard of the Stewart platform, which I haven't, so I don't blame you if you haven't, um, you can actually create this thing called a hexapod where you can tilt the both the upper end and lower ends of the scope with all six or whatever degrees of freedom. And uh, this means you can then eliminate the collimation adjustments on both your mirror holders. And then, I mean, you can collimate this thing by adjusting the wires, but you could compensate for any deflection of the wires with a hexapod. And if you have a um, collimation adjustment by HX, essentially you're tipping and tilting the truss -like pole lights to compensate, um, then your primary mirror doesn't have to have any adjustability, which uh, if you ever tried or looked at a primary mirror is over at Opsoni, it's this wicked complicated thing. And about 90% of that is the fact that it has to be able to move the collimation. The sling has to move or the exports have to move. So often you have like this, you, have, you might have two metal assemblies on these big mirrors. Go, yeah, you don't need that anymore. You just need a something with support pads and the edge supports and it can be fixed in place at the bottom of the scope. So this cuts down hugely on the cost, complexity, and physical footprint of the scopes, because you also need to, don't need to have those collimation screws sticking out anymore, which means your scope can be lower to the ground. Um, it's all these cascading things. And of course, six poles is less weight um, than uh, eight, so you gain some uh, weight back. You do have to have something to keep your shroud or the light path on six poles, but uh, it's pretty cool. Um, and you do this usually with, um, turnbuck with uh, turnbuckles or hind joints. Um, basically, you need the poles to be able to be either unscrewed one by one or in pairs, and you can make collimation adjustments that way. It's really cool. It also compensated for uh, um, back focus with like four inches of adjustability on the poles, which is pretty great. Um, again, I'd show you one, but I didn't really have a good photo when I made this, and it's hard to demonstrate um, anyway, even if it did. But there's a lot of great threads. Just search up uh, hot takes of pop Sony on sites like Cloudy Nights or on YouTube, and uh, you can find some uh, videos and photos that really explain it. Um, also, uh, sort of getting back to that whole observatory thing, um, yeah, uh, of course, the equipment is only one part of it. Um, the other end is, of course, the, um, the doing outreach stuff. But there's one more piece of equipment that I really have to talk about, um, and that's uh, the uh, low cost end. Of course, I've just been talking about big dot settings for about 10 minutes or so. But, of course, those aren't things for beginners, those are things that you get as your second or third skill. So if you want to build your own scope, actually, it is cheaper to build than to buy. Why? Well, you can get these mirrors from China from AliExpress for less than a good eyepiece costs. Um, and you can go up to about eight inches. Um, they do say they're spherical. You have to kind of avoid the short focal length spheres that are not meant for telescopes. Uh, but these, these um, I found some listings that I vetted and are good. And it's, you can learn how to find stuff that's legitimate. Um, I actually have a URL here that you can uh, put in your phone or computer and uh, look at a list I've made and I update. This works for eyepieces too. Um, I'm going to apologize to all the eyepiece manufacturers now, but I just I refuse to pay uh, $1,300 for my 9mm ES120. So I went and bought one on AliExpress for 704 dollars actually it was 680 when I bought it. Um, it is exactly the same, has a serial number, and it cost me one half. You can do this with anything down to cheap beginner eyepieces like this 25 millimeter cone that's in this scope here. Um, and uh, there's Nagler clones for like $80. They work, again, I have a list that I've made sure that stuff actually is acceptable um, just for people's convenience, but um, it's pretty easy to figure out what sort of stuff to do, and you will save big time. If you're looking to equip yourself with some good eyepieces, especially, it's really worth checking out the OEM deals like this because it's actually gonna be cheaper than buying one used. Because people saw used stuff are insane these days. I can't find a C8 for less than a thousand bucks on clock drive in four pounds, it's crazy. Um, you might be noticing this thing. Um, this has got some 3D printing in it. So why would you 3D print? Plastic is this terrible material, right? It's just, it's horrible, it's so easy to destroy, and we think of it as a sign of low quality. Yeah, but how hard is it to make anything out of wood or metal? It, it is a major commitment. Plastic, you just pull it, put it in a cab, printer shoots it out, boom, done. Um, you don't need a shop, so if you're in a college dorm or something, you don't have to worry about going to some shop and asking for time. You can just, if you own a 3D printer already, you can just make one. Printers aren't that expensive either, by the way. Um, you can also modify things on the spot. You can make a new part in five minutes with slightly different from the one you just made. Um, but a lot of small parts in telescopes that we like, like adapters and rings and clamps and all sorts of things, and brackets, we pay hundreds of dollars for these stupid little pieces of machine metal, all the like 
hold your green laser in alignment with your telescope. That can that mean that can be resigned to history now. Uh, I've seen people print all sorts of astrophotography adapters, can, cable management, guide scope brackets. Um, as long as it doesn't have to have really, 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 really good tolerances, you can print that uh, with temperature on that. You can print it pretty much. Uh, that brings it to this thing. This is uh, my friend uh, Jonathan. He actually designed most of this. Um, this is uh, the Hadley 114mm telescope. That's hitting him with one with a better base than the one I threw together. Mine, uh, the screws hit it. So I, I can't point it straight up. Oops. Oh, well, I don't like anything to say that anyway. This is a 114mm F8, which is a standard design that's existed since the 1960s. Um, somebody here at, uh, at Open Text was reminding me how he had a Tasco uh, with the exact same optics as this that he got as a kid in 1968. So not only can you get the optics for this for less than $40, but you can also just go raid somebody's basement, find one of these scopes, and go, uh, one of those scopes got the optics uh, from the 0.965 inch focus or undermounted junk that those usually are, and uh, put in one of these. And uh, you don't need power tools to even make the base. Somebody designed a base that you can print that you just use more aluminum or metal or whatever poles and then you just screw it to a lazy Susan, which I realize isn't the best, but if you're terrified of power tools or in a college dorm or something, it will provide an out that you can make and that will do. Um, and uh, the lack of having to um, ship a whole tube assembly means the only things you're paying for are a bunch of Home Depot stuff, your filament, the optics and the eyepieces. And so the cost is really low. You can get it down to about 80 to $125. That's a pretty wide range, but it sort of depends on like, th these are aluminum. Uh, I like the aluminum poles. You can use dowels, but you have to be a little careful. You have to like stand there going through dowels at Home Depot, making sure they're straight, which is kind of annoying. Um, and eyepieces too. Um, like you can get a acceptable eyepieces for like four or $5 if you buy a pack of five of them. Otherwise it's gonna be like 10. Um, so there's that too. Uh, and um, yeah, they, there's, there's more of this. Um, so there's like uh, something between 500 and 1,000 of these in existence, and this scope has only been available on Thingiverse and Printable since June, maybe May. Um, mine was one of the first one printed. Um, actually, I, I made this one, I don't have a printer. I found a guy uh, in the same city as me in Tucson who had just made one, and he was like, oh, uh, you, you want one? I'll print you one. And he was one of the first handful of people to print one of these. And that's there, so that's why it's hard to estimate downloads uh, and translate that to the number of people who print it, because thousands of people have downloaded it, but of course not everyone prints them. By the same token, a lot of people are sending the files directly to their friends, or downloading them privately, or downloading remixes, or they're printing multiple of them. So there's, but we know there's probably a few hundred of these in existence at a minimum. And it's a Dobsonian, so it's not different from any other dog, you know, you just aim it around the sky. We have an iron sight that you can use. Uh, to aim it, which the iron sight's not the greatest, but uh, it's cheaper than a red dot, and you can print a bracket for a red dot. It's got a helical focuser, which is pretty cool. Um, you just twist the focus, it's got threads, it's pretty easy, even at high power. Um, the bearings are pretty big, but I like to spring tension them, most people spring tension them. Um, the poles are 36 inch aluminum poles or dowels uh, or conduit that you don't even need to cut. I like leaving a little bit on the end because you can use it as a handle. Um, and everything uses standard number 10 hardware, though you can also just print a metric version. There's uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And uh, there's fully adjustable collimation on both mirrors. Um, and uh, it's very easy to set the focus, the spacing right for focus, et cetera. Um, there's even a baffle for under the secondary here to help with the straight light. Um, you could make a shroud or something like this, but it's nice to just leave it open because then you can show people how it works. Oh, also the spider, there's like five different versions of spider. Three vein, one vein, curves, two curves. Four veins, uh, this weird interferometer one that was made as a joke, but actually has some weird purposes. Um, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Um, you can also adapt it to a short focal length primary. If you wanted to build an F4 version, there's nothing stopping you. And there's some work being done now to make a, make a version that can be scaled to about five or six inches, or down a little bit too, which is pretty cool. Uh, this is a photo I took with this with my iPhone. Um, obviously, it's not going to win APOD, but it did win um, uh, top of Reddit for like a few hours, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, it's really sharp. Um, a 114 F8 is a sphere, these are spheres usually, but they're well past the fraction limited and they are also extremely, extremely common. So the manufacturers have figured out how to make these pretty consistently good. Mine specs out at um, pretty much no issues with the mirror besides the sphere, slight bit of like eighth of a way spherical that occurs with this. I ended up against a C5 SE 
last you know, night worked fine. Uh, I put it up against ETX 90s and all sorts of you know good small scopes, even a Takahashi, and it it wins as long as the aperture isn't actually bigger than the other scope or much bigger. Um, and of course, again, it's really easy to use. You can carry this with one hand. It's about 10 pounds on the mount. I actually had to put a lead bag to weight it down. Um, but again, it's you know it's lightweight. It's grab and go. You can compact this. You can make a base that folds up or sign, or make a base where you arrive when you go somewhere and fit it in a suitcase. But um, there's no tripod to deal with, and it's not a tabletop scope, so you don't have to worry about getting like an IKEA stool and stable enough, and getting the scope on air and walking into it and knocking the scope off. There's something stupid like that, which has happened. Um, and of course, it's four and a half inches, so it will do some deep sky. I mean, there are people being conned into buying expensive four inch go to scopes all the time as their first telescope, and those things are less capable and way more expensive. And uh, this, this is pretty nice. And again, it, it will be able to scale, and of course, uh, you know, larger sizes. You can always build that yourself too. The sort of idea with this is that you know you might build one of these if you've never owned it, even if you've never owned a telescope before, which most of the people making these have never had a scope before. You build one of these and you go, oh wait, you know, maybe maybe telescopes aren't that complicated actually. You know, maybe, maybe maybe it wouldn't be that hard to maybe get some get a drill and saw, maybe go knock together an eight or ten inch. Maybe I, you know, maybe I could grind my own mirror. And that actually has happened with quite a few of the people who are making these, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, I, uh, somebody I know actually, the guy who printed this for me has made a full go-to version that works pretty well. Uh, with the motors and stuff, you're also going into the price range of just building a bigger scope, but uh, it'll be scalable eventually, which is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, these are some of my living room, and they'll under to 114 as a comparison in the background. Um, and there are, again, hundreds of these have been made already. There might be a thousand or so in existence. And again, this scope has only been downloadable and printable for about 10 weeks. so. Uh, you can extrapolate how far it's going to go from that. Again, I'm not the inventor of this. I helped, I helped design by committee, sort of, with a lot of other people when making suggestions as this was created, but I really am not the guy behind this. I don't even know how to use CAD. Um, and uh, the nice thing about this scope is, I'm going to put my back down for a second. I can bring it anywhere I want without a car. I can walk two miles with a thing. I did. Yeah, uh, I had uh, some car problems and I had to walk home to get some. So I did walk two miles with it, but I didn't want to leave it outside. Uh, yeah, you can bring this anywhere you want, even if you don't have a car. You can strap it to your back, you can put it on a dolly, I guess. Um, you know, you could carry this truck with you if you live in a dorm or an apartment. Uh, yeah, bring it down the elevator, bring it on the subway. I don't care, I don't know. I've seen people bring it on the subway, though. It always makes a good conversation, too. Um, and uh, so then you can then set it up wherever there are large amounts of uh, interested humans, uh, typically in front of bars or restaurants is where I like to go, and do sidewalk astronomy, which is how we're all here, by the way, as John Dobbs is setting up hordes of big cardboard tube scopes that vaguely resemble this, and telling people to come up with the moon. And it turns out that's actually a really effective method of getting people into astronomy, even in 2022, where most people are going to briefly look through it and then go back to watching a TikTok and walking into the street with air pellets in. Um, Darwin smiles from above that one. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, I've made a lot of friends doing this. Um, most of the people I know in Tucson are from yelling at them to come up to the moon. Uh, and the nice thing is, again, you have to think about it sort of this way. Well, if someone's already interested in space and they go to an observatory and they have a bad time, they're not going to retain that interest. But that's assuming they even have the time and interest to go to an observatory. Because think about it, even if the observatory's in town, Okay, well, they got to go and drive to it. They got to walk in. They got to wait in line. It's got to be clear. Then they have to see something interesting, which they might or may not. The scope has to be good. The conditions have to be good. The operator has to be a nice person and explaining things well. It has to not be too crowded. Um, it has to be the right night. And of course, they have to commit the time to stand there and do all that. Again, the average person has no attention span or time. So to make someone who might not be that interested in the first place do it as a hard sell, and this is assuming they organically have the idea to look up where the local observatory is and go to it, which that 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 doesn't occur to people. It's just not a, you don't just randomly think that one day. Um, so you're not there's a huge segment of the population that's never going to go to even the best observatory that's convenient and well equipped and well staffed and it's clear every single night for ten thousand years. It doesn't matter. Those, most people are never going to have the idea in their head to go to one, much less the time and willingness to commit. But if you just ambush them with one of these, they might come back. 
uh, actually, you have instrument with one of these, they might build one. Because uh, I know there are five people who did. So um, it works. Uh, there's a reason John Dobson did it. Yes, it's harder now. People have shorter attention span. They have more things to do. But it still works. And it's a lot. It's, you're reaching a demographic that otherwise might never get to even look through a telescope, much less develop the sustained interest. You know, you got to think about too. You know, a lot of people who a lot of people who are who are you know not as well off as all of us with our big scopes and big cars. They can't afford their own telescope, or what if they buy a crappy one, but they don't have the time or money or whatever to go to an observatory. It's the, they might not have a car to get there. So you know, there's so many people out there who are never going to get to look through anything in an observatory, or or even an astronomy called night in a park, let's say, because they won't know about it. So doing this is really important. Uh, it amazed me when I first found out about Don Dobson and watched videos of him that nobody else did it anymore. And obviously, there are a lot of there are, of course, you know, you have to make sure you've got all the people with you, you've got pepper spray or something, you don't want to hang around too many drunk people too long. But overall, I mean, it's it's pretty worth doing. Um, I, I've never regretted setting up this for uh, the 8-inch in the photo here, which is actually John Dobson's uh, built with his son. Uh, I have it. I just going to bring it to the camera. And again, this is perfect for that. Because not only is it easy to set up, not only is it convenient, not only are the views of the moon planets great, but you can also tell people, hey, this only cost me 100 bucks. You set up your LX200 for people, even if you do satellite astronomy, with which I can't imagine, but it doesn't really inspire people when they find out that um, the telescope they just looked through probably costs several times more than their rent for the month. Didn't for me. Um, also, you can make money on the Getting people to do tips, which pays for your family pretty quick. Um, yeah, uh, I have a group that does it, just a handful of people, the Arizona Sidewalk Astronomers. It's not their formal organization, it's just me and people on the Discord. We've had something like 30 to 50,000 people look through our scopes this year, and most of that was just me. Like 90% of that was just me. I, I count my little ticker counters that I hand out, we press them. Um, and uh, this fall, of course, we've got three or four naked eye planets, depending on if you want to count Mercury. Um, We've got the moon, you know, the moon will be back this Saturday is International Observed Moon Night. Artemis 1 is going to launch eventually this fall, as will probably Starship. You know, most people don't know we're going back to the moon, and having to look through a telescope at the moon and tell them about that is a wonderful way to get people excited. Um, and uh, this Saturday night is International Observed Moon Night. So actually, if anybody's going to be home in time to do it, I implore anybody who has a scope that they can set up for the public to do so on Saturday. Because International Observed Moon Night is a massive thing that NASA supports and organizes, and you can you can even set a thing to on the site to so people can know that you're out there, and you can show you know you don't even have to do any advertising or signage and get a few hundred people look through your scope if you set up a busy place. And again, you don't want to set up your big computerized scope or dot, then don't you know get get the cheap scopes. It's sign people can afford. It doesn't matter if it doesn't have to be this anything. If you want to set it up, that's good enough. Um, and uh, again, you know. Um, one astronomer can have thousands of people look through their scope in a year. You know, it's, it's pretty crazy the amount of people you can reach doing this. Um, and you know, again, oh, Artemis is about to kick off with uh, Artemis 1. I mean, it would have launched uh, in the next few weeks had it not been for Hurricane Ian. Even. Starship is on the pad. It's going to be the lunar lander. Whether or not we like Elon Musk, this thing's happening and it's real and it's exciting. Um, and uh, a lot of people today don't have, I, th I think this is something that a lot of people a lot of older folks, unfortunately, don't seem to realize this. Most young people don't go to shop classes anymore. Actually, I would say very few do. I didn't. I didn't have the option. Um, there's a lot of reasoning for that. But if you look at the school, if you look at schools especially, they're all STEM, 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 and then the most they do is maybe get kids to code, and that often doesn't even happen. Or maybe play with some Lego robots. But people don't know about machining or or uh, woodworking or optics. You know, and the idea is they're going to learn all that in college or whatever they don't. But you have to get people to develop hobbies organically from a younger age. So to inspire people while they're still in grade school to maybe build their own telescope with their parents and pass on these skills like woodworking and all sorts of hobbies um, is really important. You know, if you don't get the, if you don't have people now learning to do this stuff, whether it's observing or building scopes or even, you know, or rate, another one's like radio, you know, all these different things, not just astronomy stuff. You don't have people learning these, to do these things now as a hobby. They're not going to do them as jobs. And the world needs more electricians and more plumbers, and not just rocket scientists. And we don't see people picking those things up. And eventually, society's going to grind to a halt without that stuff. Let alone, if we don't have people who are excited about space, 
and want to build this stuff and do this stuff. I mean, I need a lot of people who believe moon landings are fake or astrology is real, and they are not joking because they've been misinformed or simply not informed, and so they just pick up whatever the newest trend is. You know, you, you gotta, that, has, that has to stop. And you're not going to stop that if you hope and pray that people are going to just magically come to your events and they're going to magically see the light and learn. No, you gotta, you got to get out there. And that's, that's what this is all about. This is why I do what I do. Um, and uh, it's getting pretty good in the telescope-making world, um, actually. I, I've given out a thousand mirrors and blanks this year to people online. And a few of the people I've gotten into mirror-making are printing out like half a dozen mirrors now, and some of them want to be professional opticians. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and cyber astronomy is something I see other people online doing now, mostly on Reddit. People who have seen me post about it go and do it, and then they discover, oh wow, interacting with other people isn't that scary. Shocking. Um, and, uh, you know, we are going back to the moon. You know, a lot of people got really excited about DART the other day on social media, you know, not just space enthusiasts, and that's really, that's really a great sign. You know, the launch of the two most powerful rockets ever made is going to also make a pretty big splash when it happens. Um, and Artemis II is always going to fly our moon with people in just a couple of years, and then the landing really comes down to public support and funding. Um, and um, a lot of people are really concerned about light pollution and its effects on uh, astronomy interests in general. Um, of course, with something like this, you can, you're going to be looking at the moon and planets anyway. You can look at those anywhere. It doesn't matter. Get people interested in the moon and planets, and then you can educate them on light pollution and deep sky stuff and big scopes. you got to get them interested. Get their foot in the door, and then you can worry about the rest. And the good news is light pollution. I, uh, I'm a member of the uh, Southern Arizona uh, IPA chapter. The good news is uh, a lot of light pollution awareness now is coming from sort of a different front than astronomy, uh, from cultural, environmental stuff. And there's been a lot of successes on that recently. We have a long way to go. But uh, in general, I mean, even with just full cutoff shielding on your streetlights, the situation is getting better faster than it's getting worse. It obviously depends on the place. But it's certainly the state of it is a lot better than it was 10 or 20 years ago. It's an issue that if you, if you mention the word light pollution to the average person, they might actually know what it means from my experience. And that, that wasn't true. The IDA was only founded 30 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, this is an analog thing. People spend a lot of time looking at screens. I love my iPhone. But I'm sorry, but it, looking at photos of space on your iPhone isn't the same as the real thing. And everybody from the telescope manufacturers to a lot of older folks on forums wants you to think that, that, that oh, you know, the, everybody's looking at these gosh darn screens. We gotta, we gotta do that for astronomy. No, let me know. That, that's silly. Because we can, we can do that for every hobby. We could, then, then we're just gonna be in the metaverse all the time. Do you want that? I don't want that. I don't want that to be my future. I know that. Um, and this is way more uh, inexpensive and engaging than even the cheapest electronically assisted astronomy so is ever going to be. Uh, you simply can't make it that cheap. Um, and of course, um, I, I'm really hoping to learn how to slump my own meniscus mirror blanks in a kiln. Uh, that's one of the big things to them because there's, that's something that I think is going to really change the role of big aperture scopes in the next few years. Um, because uh, especially if glass costs keep going up, and of course, um, People are not, you know, people are not getting any more enthusiastic about moving 20-inch F5s with massive full thick with two-inch mirrors around. Because I see them for sale all the time. But uh, I'm really excited about this thing. You know, I, I think we're, I think that the, the 10,000 mark of these is probably going to be cracked, uh, probably around Christmas, would be my guess. And that's more people getting into telescope making from this thing alone than probably have gotten into it from anything else in the entire time I've been alive. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, and uh, if you're interested, you're wel uh, anybody's welcome to come through, through my 14.7 inch uh, f2.9 tack sharp stars, 1.7 degree field. I'm going to have it set up, and I'll have this set up too. Um, we're probably just going to we're probably just going to aim it at Saturn, but it's pretty fun. Um, I will say, like again, I, I mostly observe big scopes, but I get a kick out of just setting this up in my yard and looking at stuff with it because it's really nice to just have a scope where there's no polar line, no collimation, no nothing to worry about, and you can just pop it down in one piece, keep the eyepieces in the base of the scope, and just get going. So. Even if you're not a beginner to astronomy, I think it's worth looking into making one of these. I don't have a 3D printer, I got a friend to do it. Um, you can have shops online do it, you can go to your local makerspace, or you can just pester somebody you know who has one. And uh, it's a pretty easy print, too, uh, which is nice. That's all I have. Um, there's some uh, links here um, on for, here for my uh, AliExpress uh, uh, thing with a list of the stuff. Um, and uh, if, for those of you who use Reddit or Discord, um, um, there's two fabulous groups I highly recommend joining. Um, yeah, so that's all I have for today. Um, I hope that was informative. Uh, I would love to go into some of those subtopics uh, for longer periods, and I'll probably probably do that uh, at some point. 
Uh, I, I'd like to wait on the Miss Spears, but I have more to say about them. But I am grinding, polishing a pair of them right now, and it's going pretty well. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, I guess the questions come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? If anyone wants to ask questions, yeah. where are you located on the field? Oh, I'm over. Uh, there's a you'll, well, right now the blue canopy, but um, I'm right across from the 22 that uh, Mike Lockwood is messing around with, and there's a 30 inch Pika Eyes, not Pika Eyes, sorry, 30 inch <laughs> Star Structure. I looked at Pika Eyes and asked earlier, so I'm confused. Star Structure that I'm like across the little street from. It's uh, right by the main avenue that's used to get in and out, because um, that was where I was just where I picked. Yeah, I'm not so familiar with it. Other questions? <laughs> Let's thank our speaker again. Oh yeah, um, yeah, I'm over, I'm over, uh, over up there by those those trees. Okay, okay. okay. everybody saw that.